Do you believe what we just sang? Really believe it no matter what? <clears throat> then my lesson is probably, probably not needed tonight. Don't go. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> In John chapter 6, Jesus fed the 5,000. And after the feeding of the 5,000, they come back to Jesus the next morning. In fact, they have to walk all the way around the Sea of Galilee, try to find him. And they find him. They've got a lot of questions for him, but primarily on the top of their discussion is, we're hungry again, feed us. Jesus says, you're not asking me for food because you saw this miracle and believed, but only because you ate more filled. And then he challenges them to look for the bread that doesn't perish, the food that doesn't perish, but that leads to eternal life. And the, the people are still thinking physically, and so they're like, hey, give us that bread, you know. Because then we, you know, just think, you know, you never got to go to grocery shopping again. You never got to cook anymore. And they don't understand. And so he starts talking in very strange terms. He starts saying things like, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're, they're confused. You know, they get kind of a cannibal kind of, how can this guy give us his flesh to eat? What's going on? They're confused. What Jesus, of course, was teaching them was, you have to assimilate me. There's this crazy thing where you eat something, and it actually becomes part of you. It becomes who you are. Grapes become eyeballs. Hot dogs become fingers. You know, that's the way it works, right? Well, not quite. So that's not quite the way it works. But we understand assimilation. Okay, we don't understand how it works, maybe. But we understand we are what we eat. So Jesus is saying, you've got to eat me. You've got to assimilate me. You've, I've got to become, you have to become me. And that he was going to make that possible. Instead of, instead of swallowing this, if I may say, they're choking on it. And they can't think spiritually. And so something interesting happens later in the chapter. In verse 60 of John chapter 6. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? What do you do when you don't What do you do when you don't know what to do with this teaching, this thing that happens to you? What do you do? I'll tell you what these people did. When Jesus... Um, and when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he says, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man descend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Verse 66 says this didn't help the situation. In fact, in many ways it made it worse. And from that time, many of his disciples, those who had been following his teaching, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. There's an interesting side note. That when the teaching got difficult, Jesus didn't change it. And when his disciples start to walk away, he doesn't go chasing after them. Just kidding. You know, I'll, 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 I'll take a poll and what you want me to say, what you want me to teach, you know, I'll, that's what I'll do. I'll teach the acceptable thing. But instead he kept teaching it. In fact, in some ways he raised the bar and made it more difficult for them. He turns to the 12 who evidently aren't leaving, and he says to them in verse 67, do you also want to go away? And here's what they say. Peter is sort of their spokesman. Lord, to whom shall we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you think that the apostles fully understood what Jesus just taught? I don't think so. In fact, I'm pretty sure not because in just a short time, Jesus is going to start explaining to them that he's going to die on the cross. And they, you know, Peter himself is one of the ones that says, no way, that's not going to happen. So the question is, when you don't know, when the apostles didn't know what this teaching was, didn't know what to do with it, didn't know how to understand it, didn't know how to apply it yet, what did they do? And why? You know the reason. The why is easy. The why is, you are the Christ, the Son, living God. They believed not just in what Jesus said, but they believed in who he was. And they believed that whatever the Christ, the Son of the living God says, they're words of eternal life. We may not know what to do with them. We may not know quite how to understand them yet. We may not know exactly how to apply them and wrap our brains around them yet. But we know one thing. They're true. They're true. That's why I said a few minutes ago, if you really believe in that song that you just sang, then all the rest gets really easy real fast. You've seen the t-shirts, you know, life is soccer, all the rest is details. You've seen those kind of things. And, and for Christians, life is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then all the rest is details. Now it's just a matter of finding out what he says, what he means, and how to use it. When we don't know, we have to ask ourselves, how do we respond? Let me give you some illustrations of some difficult settings. Before we do that, I'll thank you for being here tonight, studying with me. I'm going to try to stretch your thinking tonight. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for that. And I'm not going to answer all the questions. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to open the door to the answers. And then I'm going to say, and when you're done, when you're done searching for the answers, if you don't find the answers, and when you're done searching and you still can't quite understand, you still know one thing. Our God, he is alive. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he sent the Spirit with this message. And this message is true. Why do good people sometimes suffer? Why do evil people sometimes not suffer, seem to get ahead in life? And, and there's a lot of questions that, that chase that rabbit. And I think I have some ideas. I think I can tell you some reasons. But if that doesn't answer everything about why you or somebody that you care about is suffering, what are you going to do? Why do people die? And why do people die the way they die? This very righteous person suffers and drags on. This person over here seems to die, uh, live a long life and suffer what, or have what we might consider to be an easy death if there is such a thing. How can God be good and seem to let bad things happen? Again, I think I have some answers to that. But sometimes when I present these answers, people are already shaking their heads. No, that doesn't get it from me. Okay. Um, okay. What are you going to do with that question, that doubt? How can God choose us, which we know from Scripture that he does, and us still choose God? It's the question of predestination. <laughs> Clearly in Scripture... There's a sense in which God chooses us before time begins, Ephesians chapter 1. And I think I can explain in which way he chooses us. There are some people who just can't wrap their brains around the fact that God chooses us and us choose him. And I'm like, okay, what are you going to do with that? When, when you don't know how to answer that. When you don't know to an, how to answer how God can be omnipotent and us still have a choice. Sovereign. What are you going to do 
Is God over all things? Yes. But can we still choose? Do we have a free will? Yes. We know that the scriptures teach both. And I, again, I think I have some explanations as, as to what sovereignty means and what free will means, but, but not all people are satisfied with that. How can God be a God of love and still judge people? Or worse, send people to hell? Now, I can explain that I don't think God actually sends people to hell. People really send themselves. We're all headed to hell, and God, God is trying to save us from that. But again, but you still keep hearing people talking about a loving God who would send people to hell. How is that possible? How can God be one, which the Bible clearly says he's one, and yet three persons? And you can tangle with some people who are saying, do you believe the Father's God? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Yes. Oh, there we got two. And the Holy Spirit is God? Yes. And you say, well, how is that possible? And, and I think I have some pretty good explanations, some pretty good illustrations to try to help us wrap our brains around it. But the fact of the matter is there are some things about God that are very difficult for us to, in our limited brains, really fully understand. Because we're not God. The truth be told, if you can fully understand God, then you're God. Uh, so there's some things about God that we're not going to understand, that we're going to accept by faith, that he has revealed that through his son, who he raised from the dead, and we're going to say, okay, I, I believe that. I accept that. I'm not going to go away because this is a difficult saying that I'm having a hard time understanding. How is it that we have to obey and yet salvation is not by works? I'm studying with somebody right now that's struggling with that. Um, do we have to obey? Do we, but, but salvation is by faith, yes, to both. Can we accept both? Because God says, scripture says both. And I think there are some explanations, but, but it, it's not working with him. And so we get down to the end and we say, okay, are you going to do what the word of God says or not? What do you do when you don't know, when you can't quite reconcile them? Do you accept them anyway? One more. How is it that we're saved by grace and yet we still have to believe? Or we still have to obey? There's an interesting verse in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. In fact, this lesson is based on this verse in many ways as an illustration of this principle. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Here's a fascinating verse because it's a verse that tells us something tells us that we don't know some stuff. Why didn't John just tell us? Instead of wasting his time and saying that time's going to come and we are going to be raised, we're going to be changed, we're going to be like Jesus, and here's what that's going to be like. Just tell us. Uh, the reason he didn't tell us is because he didn't know. He wasn't going to speculate. He wasn't going to speak where God's spirit had not moved him to speak. And so he just had to say... We don't know because it has not yet been revealed. But we do, that doesn't mean we don't know anything. We know some stuff. We know he's coming. We know that we'll be like him. We know that we're going to see him as he is. So we've got some hints there, but that's all we know. This is an admission that there are some things that we simply don't know. And that we're going to have to be content to hear from God, to hear from Scripture, you don't know. I don't know. By the way, when you're studying with somebody, it, it should never be. Uh, it, it should never be considered a, you know, a failing when you say I don't know. Uh, first of all, if you don't say you don't know about something that you that you don't know, you're lying. And, and second, second, uh, there's, uh, nobody knows everything, but we do know where to look. And so we go into God's word together. We try to find what God says. And sometimes we don't know even after scripture because God doesn't tell us. And we've got to be content with that. We can't walk away from God because he doesn't tell us something. 
because he doesn't fully explain it to our satisfaction. Because that's what happened with those people back in John chapter 6. As far as I can tell, Jesus never explained, even to his disciples, John chapter 6, that whole eating my flesh and drinking my blood thing. I think, I'm not saying they never understood it, but they said, even if we don't understand, we're not going anywhere. And that's what I want us to learn from today's lesson. What I want us to learn is don't quit. Don't quit. Abandonment is not, is not an answer. It's, it's not, not only is it not going to provide answers, but it's, it's not going to help the situation. There are people who, when they run into some of these questions that they're struggling to answer, sometimes they abandon, they abandon God, they abandon uh, the faith, they abandon the Bible and the study of the Bible. Sometimes they abandon everything that they already know and, and have accepted to be true. They can't wrap their mind around the, the, the oneness of God. And because of that, they abandon some of the clear things of Scripture, which, which they can understand and which they've already accepted. Well, you know, if I can't understand this, then they throw the whole thing, baby out with the bathwater, they throw it all away. The Lord says, don't do that. You accept what you, what you know to be true, and the things that you're working on, the things that you're truly chewing on, shouldn't affect the things which you've studied and accepted to be true about God. In John chapter 6, when the disciples were struggling with this eat my flesh and drink my blood thing, they had accepted that Jesus Christ was the Christ, the Son of the living God. They had already accepted that he had the words of eternal life. They had accepted that. And one lesson, one thing that they were struggling to wrap their brains on, what does that mean? Didn't shake them away from that. In fact, I think in many ways, a lesson like that draws them closer to Christ, come to him to find out the answer, rather than abandoning him. You're familiar with Galatians chapter 1. I marvel, verse 6, that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to another gospel. Paul preached the gospel to them, left, and in comes a bunch of other people preaching something different. And I think it twisted their heads. The turning, you have turned away so soon from him. And we're going to find out later in the book of Galatians, a lot of it has to do with keeping the Old Testament law and salvation by works and all kinds of things like that. Uh, and they were abandoning the grace of God. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure that this was a very difficult time for Jewish people to try to understand the change in covenant and the change of mode of forgiveness and that it's now through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm sure that was extremely difficult that you don't have to keep these traditions and all of these feasts and circumcision and all this kind of stuff that now we are just saved in Christ. I'm sure that was extremely difficult for them. And what are you supposed to do when it's extremely difficult? You don't turn away from the gospel. If, any, if, if, if we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then that we have preached you, let him be accursed. He repeats it again in verse 9. There is no other way. And so abandoning Bible study because there's some difficult stuff, difficult to understand, difficult to apply, he says that doesn't make any sense. Because he said, what is it in verse 7, it's not another gospel. You're not going to find salvation in some other, some other thing. And I'm going to tell you that, that there are sometimes people will hear a difficult thing from the Bible or a difficult sermon, a difficult application, and they go church shopping. They go truth shopping. They, they think, I'll just find another church somewhere that says we can do what I want to, or I can do what I want to do. And you can find them. They're out there twisting the scriptures, changing the message of the gospel, ignoring huge sections of scripture, not talking about them. 
Paul says, you realize that that's not another gospel. Because the word gospel means good news. So it's not good news anymore. Oh, they'll call it, they'll label it good news, but he's saying it's not. So because we run into something difficult, we must not stop studying. We must not stop searching. We must not stop being around and, and getting help from strong Christians. We must not gravitate toward those who tend to agree with us, who will tell us that we're right, no, no matter what we're doing. People who don't understand and apply the scriptures very well we must not do that. That is abandoning Jesus Christ. That's quitting. And, and while I'm at it, let me just add one other thing. And that is, we mustn't settle for what I'm going to call bad. For example, oversimplification. I'm just going to tell you, there are some difficult and complicated concepts in Scripture sometimes. And sometimes we don't want to do the brain wrestling that we have to do to really understand it. And so we just step back and we just say, you know, it just, what, what's the saying? It mean, says what it means and means what it says. And we don't think it through. We don't do the hard study and looking up words and trying to figure out if this is something that is symbolic or that this is something that Jesus is saying. That's what the people in John chapter 6 said. They were like, gross me out. How am I supposed to eat his flesh? Oversimplification. We know that's not what, that's what he said, but that's not what he meant. The statement, it means what it says and says what it means, is not correct. It means what it means. That's what's correct. Because sometimes there are statements that don't mean what they say. Pluck your eye out, cut your arm off does not mean literally pluck it out every time you have a temptation. Now, there's an application to that verse that we a lot of times miss. We turn it into something that is almost no sacrifice at all. But the fact of the matter is, is that that does not mean what it says. It means what it means. We need to dig deeper for the meaning. And that's the purpose of a lot of Christ's teaching. I believe in John chapter 6, he was doing something intentionally that's a lot like the parables, where Jesus taught parables not to illustrate sermons. He taught parables to challenge people's thinking. And whereas some people were hearing lessons and going home with gardening tips, parable of the sower, some people were going home with a deep lesson about the hearts of men. Don't settle for things we can't know, speculations, flippant answers, illogical answers, not well thought out answers. And there are plenty of those swirling around. Sometimes we would rather have an answer rather than no answer at all. But a bad answer is worse in many ways than no answer. Because no answer means we're still looking. But a bad answer means that I think I've, I've, I've settled on an answer and I don't have to look anymore. And, and, and while we're at it, let's talk about looking for a specific answer. Don't, don't settle for an answer that you are looking for. Don't read into Scripture what you want. We need to read out of Scripture what it means, what God, what God the original author, meant. When, when, when we don't know the answer, there's tons, of, there's tons of answers that I would like it to be because, because maybe it's easy or maybe it says that I'm, I'm right or I'm a good person. Uh, maybe it means I don't have to change or sacrifice. And so I go looking for that. Or it's the traditional answer. And so I go looking for that answer. This is what we do. And so I'm going to look and find that what we do is right. That's the wrong way to study. What, what does God say we should do? And if it's not what we're doing... And we have to change what we're doing as God's people. 
as God's church. And I also want to discourage you from building what I'm going to call beliefs on questionable interpretations and speculations. Because here's what happens. Sometimes there's a questionable doctrine or teaching or a speculation. And then what happens is, so that's like the first generation of teaching. And then from that one, we reach another conclusion. And from this one, we reach another conclusion. We get several generations of reasoning out. And we are way out there away from the Bible. Because it started in the wrong direction. I'll give you some examples. Calvinism. We're so sinful, we're so depraved that we cannot choose God. If that's true, which I don't believe it is true, if that's true, then it logically follows that God has to choose us. He has to predestine us. Okay? That means, and if he chooses us, then we can't fall away. I mean, God doesn't make mistakes if he chooses you then he doesn't make any mistakes. So, of course, if God chooses you and says you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved no matter what you do. That's once saved, always saves, saved. Impossibility of apostasy. And on Calvinism goes. But it started in the wrong place. And then after that, all the dominoes started to fall. Infant baptism. We inherit Adam's sin is what we're told. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. But if you believe that we inherit, or somebody believes that we inherit Adam's sin, if babies die, they go to hell. So we have to find a way for them not to go to hell. So we have to baptize babies, even though it contradicts the New Testament teaching of faith and repentance. What do we do about that? Godparents. Godparents will believe for them. We're, we're getting way out there. When we can just say, no, the Bible doesn't teach inherited sin. Sin is an action that we choose to do. The Mary doctrines. So if we inherit sin and Jesus was sinless, oh boy, you know, the Holy Spirit is, you know, is the one that it caused him to be conceived in Mary, but Mary would be sinful, so he would like be some mutant half-sinner of some kind, if we inherit sin, which I don't believe we do. So to get rid of that, at the very moment of Mary's conception, they came up with the immaculate conception, the Holy Spirit did an act of grace, and she was conceived without sin. Okay, so she is born without sin. So now when she has baby Jesus, Baby Jesus can also be without sin. Therefore, Mary didn't sin either. Therefore, Jesus is born sinless. Mary didn't die because we died because of sin. So we have to have the assumption of Mary. We can pray to Mary because she goes directly into the presence of God because she doesn't have any of her own personal sin. It just, is, it just gets crazy. All based on the fact that we inherit sin and we're trying to come up with reasonable explanations as to how things could be that we find in the Bible. Why can't we just say, you know what? You know what? We all sin. And somebody says, yeah, but why? And I, I think I have some good reasons as to why we all sin. But whether or not I can explain to somebody else's satisfaction why we all sin, why we are all sinners, that doesn't mean we're born sinners. The Bible clearly seems to be teaching that we're not. That we're not born sinners, but that we all choose to sin. So, it's, so what I'm saying is, is don't, don't build beliefs on questionable interpretations and speculations, because this is what happens. And one more. Don't ignore the problem. <clears throat> Just doing nothing. There are a lot of people who... They're reading it through scripture and they go, oh, what's that? I don't get that. I don't think that's right. Or I think God, how can God be good and this happening? Or somebody comes up with some Bible question and, <clears throat> you know, we, we, we don't know how to answer it. And so we just kind of filed that away and we don't do anything about it. We don't 
we don't, you know, track it down and tackle it, and, and we don't ask anybody because they might think I'm doubting or maybe I'm joint, you know, falling away or becoming an atheist or something like that. And so the question sits there idling under the surface and festering, waiting, growing, waiting for a challenge to, 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 to kind of add to it and magnify it. And then all of a sudden you have this major life crisis and you say, well, I've had questions all along anyway, which, which very, you know, might be true because, because you've, you've not been dealing with the questions. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, a rather familiar verse where it says, we're to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Give him the best position. Set him aside higher than anything else. Nothing else first. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You're going to tackle these things. You're going to try to think these things through. You're going to study these things. You're going to pray about them. You want to find the answers. Sometimes you're going to find from Scripture that there isn't an answer given from God. And sometimes you're going to find a difficult answer. And you're going to need to spend more time with it. You're going to need to chew on it. You're going to need to spiritually mature in order to understand it. Because there's some stuff that's meaty, chewy, gristly. Not just to understand, but also to apply. Sometimes we think of the meat of the word as just things that are difficult to understand. But the meat of the word may also be something that's calling on you to make a great sacrifice for the Lord. And you start choking on it. Because it's tough and you're not spiritually mature enough. Your faith isn't strong enough. Your hope that is in you in going to heaven is not the most important thing to you. And so this verse says we need to work on that and not just let it idle in the background. Real quick, let's, let's talk about some things. Let's talk about some things to do. Okay? Some things not to do. Let's talk about some things to do. Surely, surely we are familiar with, um, with Acts 17 and verse 11. The brief scriptures daily as to whether these things were true. They're described as being noble-minded, fair-minded. Fair-minded means I'm going to give you a chance. Surely the things that Paul was preaching were radically new to them, and surely a bunch of them thought it was just flat wrong, that it can't be right. He's quoting all these prophecies and applying them to Jesus Christ. And so what did they do? They go down to the synagogue and they roll out the scroll and they look it up. To see if the things that he was saying were true. That's what a good, that's what a, a good fair mind, a good and honest heart does. Even if it contradicts what you thought, even if it contradicts what you did, and even if it contradicts what you like, you are going to search for it and you're going to try to see that I am going to find out if that's really what the scriptures say and what the scriptures mean. And I want to suggest to you a basic principle. The Bible clearly has a milk to meat kind of flow to it. We start off with easy things and we work toward the more difficult, not the other way around. One time I was studying with a denominational preacher and he wanted to study the book of Revelation. And, um, and he started off by saying that the book of Revelation is like a... Um, he said, a lot of people think you should study the, Bi the rest of the Bible first and then the book of Revelation. He said, really, the book of Revelation is like, you know, uh, when you come in your house and you come in the back door. When you're familiar with it, when you're comfortable, you know, you come in the back door. I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting way of saying it, but it's totally wrong. You don't start with meat and move to milk. You know, and so we take things that are easy to understand and we interpret the difficult things through them, not the other way around. I've seen people throw out clear, easy to understand scriptures because it didn't fit their complicated theory that they had about, I don't know, the second coming of Jesus Christ or salvation. 
And here's a verse that just plainly says it, A, B, C. And I say, does that what it says? Yes, but that can't be what it means because, and they draw this formula out that's just super complicated. I can't even quite understand what they're doing, linking scriptures from all over the Bible. I said, yeah, but that can't be. The context of this verse is not that. So what I'm saying is don't contradict clear scriptures with interpretations of difficult ones. Second, we need to build and we need to use and we need to utilize and we need to exercise our faith. This was yesterday's lesson. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of thing, things not seen. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but there is one thing that I want to point out. That there is an unseen, that you don't have, aspect to being a Christian. In other words, like I said last night, you are not going to, there's evidence for God, but you're not going to be able to provide enough evidence for God that you can see him. And it's unfair for us to say that I will only believe in God if I can see him. Because there's tons of things we believe in that we don't see, and that we base, we, we base our, our faith and even our actions on, on faith, on conclusions and trust that we reach. And faith doesn't mean knowing and understanding everything. Yes, it involves knowing and understanding some things, but it means having enough information to trust God. That's what faith means. Having enough information that I trust what he says is true. And this trust is in areas that we understand. Hey, I can see why he says don't do this because it seems like it's bad for me. And I can see why he says don't do this because it seems like it's good for us. But there are some times where he's going to ask us to trust him in areas where we don't understand. This happens to us all the time. Uh, there are... There are, when our, with our children, for example, uh, our children don't understand why we tell them no about things. We don't, they don't understand why we tell them they have to eat their vegetables. Uh, why, even though green candy is the same color as green beans, it's not as nutritious. They can't understand it. What do we do? Uh, what should we do? Okay, I'm a grandfather now, so I, you know, I'm kind of... Sometimes I, I break the rules there, but, uh, but what should we do? We help our children learn the truth about this, what, what, what is real here in areas that they don't understand what they, what they should do and what is real. And one more thing, and that is we must not put restrictions on God, on who he is and what he does and what he will do, especially restrictions that he has not put on himself. We're comfortable with things in boxes. We're comfortable with things that are, you know, that we can, we can really understand. And so we put God in a box and we say, this is God. And this is what God does. This is what God will do. This is what God will not do. And sometimes there are things revealed in scripture that he will and will not do. But the fact of the matter is, there's lots about God that we don't understand. And that he will not always fit neatly inside our box. And this is going to challenge our thinking and stretch our thinking that God can do anything he wants. Now he tells us that he doesn't want to do some things. But he can do anything he wants because he's God and I am not. He can even do things that I don't want. And that doesn't change that he is God. He can do things I don't understand. And I can't step back and say, I'm only going to believe in a God I can understand. I'm only going to believe in a God that I understand why he does everything that he does. I'm not going to do what God wants me to do until I understand all the, the things that I want to understand about it. And sometimes God just says, do it. Some things we simply have to let God be God. 
there's tons of verses about this. Job 38, uh, the Lord, when he finally answers Job out of the whirlwind, where God, Job and his friends are trying to wrap their heads around what in the world is going on. He's suffering. He's a good guy. He's a righteous guy. And, and his friends are accusing him of all kinds of stuff and trying to figure stuff out. And finally, God finally speaks and does not explain anything. We know that Job is suffering because Satan is bringing it on him. Okay, Job doesn't know that. We only know that because we get to see behind the scenes in the first few chapters. But Job never knows that. He never tells him that. We would like to think that God will explain to us things like suffering. Instead, what he does is he says, Who is this that darkens counsel by, the, by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will answer you, and you shall answer me. And then he starts into listing some of the things that he, that God has done. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. You're going to teach God what he should and shouldn't do. And so he's saying, and, 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 and this chapter is a great chapter. You should mark it and read it if you haven't read it lately. Uh, because he is just, he's just raking Job over the coals and saying, listen, you're questioning me? God is God. Uh, in the 42nd chapter, in the first six, six verses, Job says, I know you can do everything, verse 2. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. There's that thing. God can do anything. And he doesn't need my permission. He doesn't even need me to understand. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. And now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself, and I repent in, du in dust and ashes. It was, this, this is a light bulb oops moment for Job. There are paradoxes about God and the things God says and does. But we cannot put God in a box or insist that we understand all about him before we'll trust him. We need to build faith now. Now. Before the time comes when our faith is challenged, somebody one time said it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Faith in Jesus, not in self, not in others. And if something takes you away, it's not that you're quitting others, but you're quitting the Lord. That's what was happening back there in John chapter 6. Who were they quitting? The Lord. Somebody said, if being hurt by the church causes you to lose faith in God, your faith was in people, not in God. Yeah. When you don't know exactly how to deal with a situation, deal with people, for example. How could that person, sometimes there's no good explanations. There just needs to be forgiveness and repentance and confession, and we need to work those kind of things out. But, but you understand that being a Christian isn't just about getting along with people and us all being exactly the same, because we're not, and all being at the various different, the same level of, of ability and level of understanding and application, because we're not. Well, what do we do when, when that conflicts? I'll tell you what we do. We leave. But that's the wrong thing. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where, where are we going to go? We're leaving the Lord and the Lord's people. Faith in Jesus because he demonstrated who he was by rising from the dead. And by the way, that answers a lot of questions for me. If Jesus truly is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then that answers a lot of questions for me concerning creation and divorce and the Old Testament scriptures. It answers those for me. He's right about that. It takes the focus off of me and figuring it all out and counseling other people with my own ideas. I don't have to do that anymore. Jesus' words and his teaching are what it's all about. 
God says it, that settles it. You used to see that bumper sticker, maybe sometimes you've seen it. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, that's wrong. God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. The problem is that weak faith fails under trial and under extreme trial. And so we need to strengthen it now, not wait till it starts raining to start building our ark and trying to figure out some of this stuff. And when I can't know, when I don't know, there is one thing I know. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And he has the words of eternal life. I'm not going anywhere. Even if I can't explain it to you, even if you have a question that I can't quite answer to your satisfaction, or even to my own, okay, to my own. Do I really understand the, the Godhead in all of its complexity? I've got some questions. Not doubts, but questions. What do you do about that? I just keep... I want to sit at the feet of Jesus, and I'm just going to say, you said it's true. I just believe you're true. And I'll teach that, and I'll let it change me, and I'll do anything you say. Anything you say. If you aren't a child of God, that's what you're being called to. You're not being called to join some church. You're not, you know, just our creed, our way of thinking. What you're being invited to is to come to Christ for forgiveness of your sins so that you can serve him in this life and all through eternity. And so we stop arguing with him. We don't have to argue about faith and repentance and confession and obedience. We don't have to argue with him. We just have to say, what? now it's just the details. I believe in you. What do you want me to do? I'll tell you what, that's what kept the apostles following Jesus when other people left. That's what will keep you faithful to the Lord. Even when you have terrible suffering in your life and terrible struggles in your life and you're scratching your head and saying, I don't understand why this is happening to me. But I'm going to do what's right. And I'm going to serve the Lord. If we can help you serve the Lord, if we can help you turn back to Christ, tell us while we stand and sing this song.